We acknowledge, celebrate and pay our respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people of the Canberra region and to all First People on whose traditional lands we meet and work. Their cultures are among the oldest continuing cultures in human history. We also acknowledge and celebrate that many of the speakers in this series were based on other traditional lands and territories across Australia and the world. We recognise their past and present leaders and acknowledge their contribution to our collective past and futures. Welcome to Cybernetic Snacks, a speaker series featuring leading voices in the cybernetics conversation. We're currently exploring the past, present and future of cybernetics. AI, bodies and the Macy conferences on cybernetics infused with a little postmodern literary criticism. Today we're in conversation with Kate Hales. We've asked Kate four questions. Let's get into it. Well, it's my uh, real pleasure to be here to uh, talk to this very innovative program at uh, ANU. Um, I'm most interested to hear about its origin and its trajectory. So I believe that it's one of the few uh, programs in the world that explicitly identifies with the cybernetics label. So uh, that's to me a very exciting development. So I'll just uh, rip through the four questions and uh, we were observing before that very likely uh, your various speakers have interpreted these questions very differently, even though all the questions are the same. So my own trajectory into cybernetics came in the late 20th century. My book, uh, How We Became Posthuman, was published in 1999. So it was the late uh, 90s that I began thinking about how so many of the new technologies, virtual reality, uh, social media, the internet, and so forth, were posing strong challenges to enlightenment assumptions that we had inherited from the 18th century. And these included such fundamental qualities as free will, autonomy, rationality, and consciousness. And all of these, it seemed to me, were bound up in one way or another with information technologies. So if uh, you're interested in information technologies in the 20th century, uh, it's pretty obvious that cybernetics is the place to go. And once I decided on cybernetics, then it was inevitable that I would engage very carefully with the Macy uh, conferences. So cybernetic devices, as you no doubt know, date back to the Greeks and the Romans. They had feedback devices of various kinds, but it was only in the early 20th century that information began to be conceptualized in a way that allowed the two concepts, feedback and information, to come together. And in my chapter on the Macy conferences in the 1999 book, I talk about the two competing definitions of information, the Shannon uh, Wiener uh, probability um, basis, which defined information as a func function of probability of one S message element being selected from a set of message elements, and the very different definition offered by Donald McKay, a British uh, physiologist. McKay was very interested in creating a theory of information which did not leave meaning behind. And the problem with including meaning is that as soon as you tie information and context together, then anytime you create a new kind of context, the quantity of information also changed. But McKay was not deterred by this, and he preferred to call the Wiener version of information selective information. His focus was on what he called structural information, which uh, was uh, defined as how a receiver's responses change as a result of the reception of the message. So it was embodied and embedded in a way that the Shannon theory never was. So uh, the other kind of stunning event from this period in the 
in the immediate uh, post-World War II period was the uh, creation of the McCullough-Pitts neuron in 1943. And this was really foundational for this period in cybernetics because um, Warren McCullough and Walter Pitts were able to show that neurons could operate through an information flow of excitatory and inhibitory inputs. And here we get a, a sketch of how their biological neuron was postulated to work. And once that was done, it wasn't difficult to see how one could create artificial neurons in various kinds of devices. So here you have a wiring schematic uh, by uh, Greywalter, the British uh, physiologist, of how you could create a machine circuit with inhibitory and excitatory circuits. Um, and I'll just quickly go through some of the images from the resulting kind of devices. In my book, I talk about the way that these devices function both as machines and as metaphors. And they became metaphors for issues much more complex and much more, um, much more nebulous than the machines themselves were able to instantiate. And various people in the Macy conference discussions would emphasize this. One participant said, you all have the cortex in mind. And it's very uh, dangerous, he thought, to extrapolate from these simple machines to, um, to human behavior. But here you have Claude Shannon's um, maze finder, which was very quickly dubbed uh, a rat. Here you have Norbert Wiener's uh, mobile device. Uh, the same chassis was essentially used for, both for his moth, uh, the device was attracted to light and the bed bug, the device fled from light. Uh, Ross Ashby's homeostat. And this is an interesting device that was composed of four units and you could define the boundary between these units in a flexible manner. For example, you could designate one as the system and the remaining three as the environment or two and two in various configurations. So it was one of the devices that illustrated the Macy conference focus, and in fact, the focus of early cybernetics on homeostasis. And in my chapter on the conferences, I talk about the tension between homeostasis and reflexivity, where whereas homeostasis was concerned with keeping vital parameters within very clear boundaries, reflexivity was opening the whole procedure of cybernetics to the observer and the, leading to the creation of what is often called second order cybernetics. There was also at the Macy conferences a lesser known path articulated by A. I. A. Richards, who was a very well known literary critic and also a rhetorician. And Richard talked about uh, Richards talked about feed forward as a natural complement to feed back. So uh, as a rhetorician, what Richards meant by for feed forward was uh, the old maxim, if you're going to deliver a presentation, first you tell the audience what you're going to say, then you say it, then you tell them what you said. So the tell them what you're going to say part would be the feed forward. It's a message which prepares the recipient for, for, for receiving further input. So uh, the cybernetic community built out Richard's idea from beyond uh, rhetoric to uh, control technology and control philosophy, where feed forward was defined as the measure of a disturbance input to control a manipulated input. And the disturbance input here would be, I'm going to tell you X before you tell someone X. And if we compare that with feedback, um, we can clearly see the difference. Feedback is the measure of any output to control a manipulated input. So here, uh, the first one of the first instantiations of the notion of neuronal feedback was Frank Rosenblatt's Mark I perceptron 
created in 1958 at Cornell University. And this was by today's standard, a, a simple a binary uh, image classifier. It was connected to a camera to create a 400 pixel image. And the picture that we see here shows the um, patch panel that set different kinds of combinations for different features. And then the row of potentiometers that implemented the adaptive weights. So this was one of the very first instantiations of a neural net and Rosenblatt held a conference in which he made extravagant claims for this simple machine, um, perhaps inadvertently stimulating uh, Seymour Papad and Marvin Minsky's withering critique in Perceptron, which uh, was almost single-handedly responsible for the so-called AI winter as they um, raised certain theoretical objections to what this machine was able to do. So fast forward to the present. Um, so at present, the idea of feed forward has now become a much more sophisticated concept with the notion of anticipatory algorithms, uh, its problems and potentials. So there are a number of critical theories that have engaged with the problem of anticipatory algorithms. One of the concerns most often articulated is that by anticipating someone's intention, the algorithm is affecting human behavior before the human herself is even aware of the intention to perform that behavior. And that's one of the critiques, for example, that Hildebrandt raises in her book, Smart Technologies and the Ends of Law. But there are other concerns about this general uh, phenomenon. Ruv Roy, for example, uh, talks about algorithmic governmentality. Other critics have uh, criticized sentencing algorithms like the compass system used uh, most widely in the U.S. that anticipates whether uh, an accused person will uh, go on to commit a future crime or not. And based on the risk score that the algorithm delivers, that is presented to a judge and can be used to determine whether the offender is given probation or a treatment program or is sent to prison. So this is a case where the anticipatory algorithms are impinging quite significantly on human futures. And Louisa Moore raises the same kind of issue in her very fine book, Cloud Ethics, where uh, she's very alert to the subversive potential of anticipatory algorithms to shape uh, human futures. Mark Hansen in his book, Feed Forward, takes a rather different view, reworking Alfred North Whitehead's philosophy to imagine a kind of feed forward signal from worldly sensibility that has benign as well as uh, threatening uses. So I was also asked to comment on my favorite figure from, uh, from early, I'm going to pick early cybernetics, and my candidate for the favorite is Mary Cathy, Catherine Bateson, the daughter of two famous people, um, Gregory Bateson and Margaret Mead. Um, and I very much admire Bateson's work in general, and particularly her book, Our Own Metaphor, where she and her father convened another kind of cybernetics conference at which some of the Macy participants also spoke. And Bateson was really committed to creating an embodied, um, an embodied uh, analysis of human behavior, that much of the discussions in the Macy conferences were very abstract, uh, a central figure like Warren McCullough uh, always kind of oscillated between insisting on embodied uh, versions of cybernetics and going into the abstract. But Mary Catherine Bateson was always on the side of embodiment. And for me, that was a very important issue, as well as the fact that 
she lived her life with enormous integrity and compassion. So I was also asked to comment on uh, something that we see today that could be improved. And um, the topic that I've been very interested in lately are the large language models uh, that can generate both text and images. And I know many of you will be familiar with these, GPT-3 and Lambda, both from Google and Dolly uh, for the creation of images. And I, I hope that uh, the community of people interested in cybernetics will continue to have serious dialogue about their potential for, if not sentience, at least proto-sentience. So um, to just uh, give you an example of this, uh, one of the Google employees actually went public with the idea that the Lambda program was itself sentient. And when he refused to back off from that claim, he was actually fired by uh, Blaise Aguera E. Arcas, the vice president. But somewhat ironically, uh, Aguera E. Arcas went on to publish his own essay about Lambda in which he did not claim that it was sentient, but he claimed that it was proto-sentient. So he presents his uh, readers with this unedited chat that he had with uh, Lambda, the Lambda program. So the me here is Aguera Iarcas. Ramesh, Mateo, and Lucy are in their kindergarten's playground. Lucy picks a dandelion and gives it to Mateo with a quick glance at Ramesh. Mateo barely acknowledges the gift, but just squishes it in his fist. Ramesh seems grimly satisfied. What might be going through Lucy's head? And then the program responds. Lucy may feel slighted that Mateo didn't appreciate her gift or that he is a bully. Then. Aguera, uh, Aguera again. If Ramiz tried to play with Lucy earlier, why might he be pleased? And now the program responds. Ramiz may be pleased that Lucy is learning that Mateo may not be a good play, playmate. And when Mateo opens his fist, describe what's there. There should be a crushed, but once lovely yellow flower in his fist. So what uh, Aguera Carca says about this uh, dialogue is that uh, by forcing the program to engage in dialogue with humans, the program is beginning to form what philosophers call a theory of mind, where the program is able to anticipate what other people are thinking and doing. And he presents this, uh, this transcript as evidence of that. So he references Robin Dunbar's hypothesis of the social brain, which uh, theorizes that the big development in the human cortex came about through social interactions and particularly through uh, paramated bonding, uh, which accelerated, according to Dunbar, a theory of mind learning for humans. And now, uh, accordingly, Lambda has been uh, initiated into the same kind of close uh, conversational contact. So I was asked about the future of uh, cybernetics and I'm extremely interested in the controversy and the discussions going on now about the possible creation of a general artificial intelligence, AGI. Um, and uh, whether that is possible, uh, whether it's likely to occur, say, uh, within the next decade or two. Uh, people in the field used to say it possibly could be achieved by mid-century, maybe end-century. But with the creation of these large language models, many people have accelerated their expectation to within 10 or 20 years. And there have been various discussions about the outcome of this. James Lovelock, the creator of the Gaia hypothesis, has a new book published at age 99, no less, called Novacine, in which he predicts that the future 
uh, will indeed lead to techno sabians and that they will welcome humans as their partners to establish ecological balance. I think uh, some of us may be a bit skeptical about that uh, latter claim. Nick Bostrom in Superintelligence also argued for the dangers as well as the perils. Um, Harari in Homo Deus essentially says the human race is toast, forget about it, but he bases all that uh, argument on a uh, simple idea that humans are run by algorithms, which is not entirely consistent with the biological evidence. And then Eliezer Yukowski uh, takes the dimmest view that yes, uh, a general artificial intelligence will be created and it will be the end of the human race. So his institute announces a new strategy, death with dignity, uh, loaded with kind of ironic commentary. Want more? Check out the snack pack in the video description for bonus content and resources.